Okay, <clears throat> so I'm going to talk to you about choosing a four-year institution. I'm trying to make sure it fits who you are. And that's a little bit scary in this room I talk. And it's kind of fun, right, to think about this. Now, <clears throat> when you do it, and then you kind of contrast it amongst different things, let's say when you first went to kindergarten, now, if we kind of do a little experiment right here, let's look at this for a moment. And we try to match the faces here. Right? Who's the bus driver? Me. Yeah. Who's the mom? Right. right. There's mom. And everyone else is not so happy. Right? Why is that? School. Yeah. So now by contrast, let's say when you go to high school versus you know family going to college, you know you can think about this in multiple ways, right? This is the first day, right? Who wanted to go to school? Raise your hand. Did you want to go to school? The first day you did, and after you didn't want to go, right? No, I didn't want to go either. It's like no way. It's scary. I don't know any of these people. You know, they're going over this place. And I grew up in Montana, so you know, just to give you a context for this, um, when I was in high school, there was only two Native American families, and me and the pretty young tops. That was it. And when I was in all three elementary, there was just one other family, and that was all. That's what I grew up in. Just me by myself. So I was, and my brothers, so they were kind of afraid because they were bigger and they fight, you know, back in the day. <clears throat> but now once the pastor and all that stuff. But anyhow. Um, that was it. So we all felt like this. It's like, I don't want to go. Right? Because you're, you're trying to, you know, parents are trying to get you to get on that bus or go to school, etc. And this is kind of how it is later on. You know, sometimes, right? It's like uh, my, my wife cries sometimes, you know, our oldest got married and she's thinking about the family leaving and stuff. And she goes, No, don't go. Right? That's how they feel sometimes. Or sometimes they're happy that you leave. But anyhow, the point is, right, this is kind of how it is. Or this would be the same way you feel about, you know, leaving your community, right? You're a little afraid to do that. Maybe you have friends and close ones that are saying, don't go, don't leave, right? But you need to. This is a part of what you do when you grow up. Now, if I talk, if you talk to my daughter, why people go to school, some of the reasons are pretty interesting, right? Numerous reasons why. Some go because it's fun. What do we hear Chris Powell tell you? What was the first school you went to? Remember last night? Come on. Where'd he go? What school? Did you see Boulder. Now we talked offline a little bit. And he said, "I had so much fun." I'm not going to fill in the blank, but you can figure it out, right? But he had a lot of fun, and it was fun. So he went for fun. My daughter, my youngest daughter, she wanted to go to high college so bad because she wanted to have. Fun. Now, if you were talking about the early 50s and 40s, etc., you would find that the reason you went to college was to find your significant other. Isn't that interesting? You actually went there to do that. If it wasn't high school, it was college, and that would be the person that you would have as your significant other. But the interesting thing is that while you may attend, you'll actually make friends, right? New friends, different people. Like you're meeting me. Like, maybe you don't want to be my friend, but that's okay. <laughs> but you'll meet new people. They'll change you in different ways. And I'm trying to tell you that the real reason you want to go is not a, in addition to all these things, these are true, but you also want to go because you want to obtain a degree. But the question then becomes, what degree? There are so many choices to choose from. Right? This is what I just told you. Remember, I just gave you that topic before. But the hard thing is, and this is true for us, is a transition that must occur for you to do this. Some of us, it's easy to do this. Right? Some of us had a, a background that allowed us to easily transition into that world. Some of us not. I'm guessing that it's difficult for you. I can tell you it was difficult for me. You know, I just told you briefly that going through K through 12. There was two Native American families, and I was one of them, and everyone else was not. They were all white. Can you imagine how hostile that was? Extreme. Extreme what I had to deal with. 
<clears throat> so you can imagine that my comfort zone, the idea of going to college was not so good. It's nice to be around people that look like you, talk like you, are like you, share the same foods you do. That's nice, right? It's comfortable. It's safe. You're in control of your environment. I don't have to talk to people I don't like. Right? I don't have to interface with someone that's aggressive towards me. I don't have to change people's opinions about me or change the way things happen. I can stay in that comfort zone. Right? And if I do, then I never change, I never progress, I never grow, I never move on. And the reason for that is primarily one. What do I have right here? What's it say? Fear. Fear. Afraid. You may make excuses for why you don't want to do this. To justify your decision to stay in this little circle over here where you're nice and comfortable. You may not have the confidence to do that. My confidence was built not from having a big family or dealing with all this. It was actually when I went to the military. So when I was in the army and people are screaming at you, get up, drop, right? Just getting in your face. You had him being exhausted all the time. I had to learn to immediately gain the skills to be able to adjust to this environment that was aggressive. It just got into your face. To stand up for what was mine and what was right. And that was hard. You know, because you came from being quiet and uh, having a voice, right? So he says something bad about you, and you just kind of go shut down and say anything, right? Because you're not confident enough to say anything at that point, right? Some of us are like that. Or will you say something? Will you stand up for someone? So you lack that confidence. Or maybe you lack the confidence in the sense of, you know, I've not done well in math. I've not done well in spelling. I've not done well in any of these but the thing is, you don't really know what you could be. Because remember, we were just talking a little bit earlier, is if I had taken you and put you in a family in Japan, you would be speaking multiple languages, you would love sushi. All these things that are in you would have a chance to blossom. And <coughs> you would actually be able to achieve your potential, whatever it is. Because there's things in you that would have an opportunity to grow and do something. But right now, you lack the confidence do that because you're afraid, right? I don't want to be embarrassed. I don't like being uncomfortable. I don't know how to deal with that. This is my fear. I come up with excuses. Or maybe you have this one. How many have ever heard this one before? Opinions of others somehow affected my decision to do something. Who's ever had that happen to them before? Me. That's happened to me. All of us have the opinions of others affecting us, the opinions inhibiting us from being able to do something, opinions making us sometimes do things that are consequences to that make our life more difficult, but not unnecessarily uh, unable to continue to move forward. You can still move forward. <coughs> um, I had two children when I went to college. I had nothing at the beginning, but I am here now today because I was unwilling to allow those things to get in the way. So once you overcome the sphere then, then you start learning. If you are willing to come out of this comfort zone, you will start learning. The things that you will learn are, will start to become confident in who you are. Now if you were looking at my personality style, and who has ever heard of personality styles before? Have you ever heard of those before? Personality styles? Okay, what do you know about them? I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> what do you know about? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that you know that this is describing one aspect of it. So if you were formally trained in that area, this is what they would say about personality stuff. Tell me if you fit this. They'll actually put you in four categories. The first one is. You like to work with others and you do things collectively as a decision. That's one style. Asian people are like that. They have that style. People make decisions together. Then you have another style, which is you have what's known as an extrovert. Have you ever heard that word before? Have you ever heard the word extrovert? What does it mean? 
someone that just loves to talk, right? You sat there before, right? And you're sitting there in class and oh, we're somewhere, you know, and you're Bob, Sally, you know. And the teacher says, does anybody have a question? I go, yeah, I know. They're the ones that are always going like this. And I have a voice. I want to tell you what I think. I have an opinion. You must hear it. That's the expressive person. Always have an opinion. And then there is what's known as the introvert. The person that just doesn't want to speak. They stay inside. Stay inside. My zone. Those people are usually very analytical. Right? Because we love numbers. We love understanding things. But we don't really like talking about it because it's embarrassing to do so, right? You just don't want to do it. So you have these, these personality traits, right? So expressive, the introverted person, the person does things as a collective, right? <clears throat> Which of these do you think I am? Actually, like extrovert. No, so if I you measured my skill set, and I took this test a long time ago, when I was at Sandy as a scientist, and people measured it and they said, Chris, we think you're kind of in the middle, kind of an introvert. <clears throat> and I went, wait a minute, I don't like that result. I want to be like the others that can talk. That's what I thought. <clears throat> and what we would say is that's called social denial. You know, you're, you're denying who you really are. And I would say, actually what I am is I adapt to whatever the environment is, but if you actually ask me what I love most, my wife would say, I like those numbers. I lie up very analytical. I'm more of an introvert than I am an extrovert. And this is true. Although I'm faking it out right now. Because I'm like that. <laughs> who who, who, who learns more than an extrovert or an introvert? Um, that's a good question. Now, I would say, you know, the, the person that's very analytical is the person like that. The person that gets heard the most, who may know nothing, Politician. They get heard, and us that are smart don't get heard because we're too quiet. So, what you learn though is if you're willing to step outside this comfort zone, you learn how to deal with problems, challenges that you're faced, you understand that this is not the last thing in the world, you know how to deal with these things. You've increased your self confidence in what you can do and what you can achieve, like I told you about the money. You now are in the ability to acquire new skills. So if you looked at my math skills when you first met me, you'd say, eh, Chris can't do math. Now I solve problems all the time. Calculus, partial differential equations, I describe things. That's what I do. Because if you ask me in the beginning, is this what I want to do and this is who I'm going to become, I'd say, ah, I couldn't even describe that to you. You would never guess this one. But what happens when you acquire these abilities is, you extend your comfort zone of things, and you're able to now be, to see more than just being, let's say, a policeman, or a baker, or a teacher, you got a high school teacher, right? You start thinking beyond that, because what do you do? <coughs> you establish self-confidence in who you are and what you can do. Once that happens, you start finding new purpose. You're able to start living new dream. You continue to grow in who you are. Right? You set new goals beyond what they originally were when you're in this comfortable zone. You start conquering and setting new objectives for yourself. And what's most important of all is you're able to help people in ways that you never thought you could before. Right? Think of it this way. <clears throat> Someone's sick. They have something wrong with them but you don't know what to do with them, right? But you want to help. You go to medical school, you learn this area of oncology, so you have cancer and stuff, physiology, right? And now that same person comes to you, they're sick, you know what to do to help them, and you help them. You see the difference? The desire is there to help, but the knowledge is not there to be able to do it. This is, what allow, this is what happens, right? Being able to do that. This requires a transition for you. Transitioning beyond where you currently are. Being brave enough to step beyond where you are. Right? So I'm challenging you right now. Are you willing to step beyond where you are? Yeah. Yep. Right? 
This is what you have to think about. To be able to then transition, acquire new skills, once you do that, you have new experiences, abilities, your ability to do things, knowledge, wisdom, etc., expand as a consequence of that. And you're able to do that. And college is a great way to learn these things, to acquire these new skills. Now, I wouldn't be standing before you if I had stopped just at high school and said, that's it, right? You would not be listening to me right now, right? I don't think so. So just to give you a snapshot, <clears throat> my father who passed away, um, just to give you an idea of this, I was the first to graduate from Montana State University in the College of Engineering as a Native American. I was the first to graduate from Virginia Tech in the College of Engineering as a Native American. The first. And why did that? And my father was, you know, he, he went to Haskell Indian College to learn how to become a mechanic. He then later went on and did additional training that allowed him to learn how to work on what's known as roller guns. You guys know what roller guns are? How about you guys? You guys know what roller guns are? Huge vehicles that have tires almost as big as from here to here. That are one giant thing to be able to roll on the tundra in Alaska. And so my father went on to do more. And the reason he did it is because he wanted resources to be able to help us, this giant family that of seven brothers and one sister, to be able to help them to have more than what he had. That was why. <clears throat> so he did that. And as I said, um, I went to the Army, and the reason I did that was because I had two children. Um, I progressed from being a bag boy to being a grocery cashier, working nights because <clears throat> I was the only non-white person there, so I got the, can I say bad word? I'm not going to say that. I had the fourth shift because that's what you get. I couldn't change it, no matter what. I applied for jobs within the company to try to move up. And I was always overpassed. They overlooked me every time, not giving me anything, even though I thought I was better than them. So like you, you can change that. And what's that vehicle of change? It's knowledge. So I decided, since this is the playing field that I'm being at right now, where this is where we all are, I'm going to change the playing field. I'm going to go up here where they're not. I'm going to go and get a degree, and now the playing field is different, right? I have a bachelor's. Not only a bachelor's, but a bachelor's in chemical engineering. What do you have? High school degree? You're not even close to me anymore. I can now change my future. I can change the future for my family, which was the most important reason of all, to change that for them so that they didn't have to live through the poverty that, I was, that we were dealing with. I wanted to change because I wanted something better for them. Or maybe it's simply, you want something better for you, right? That's, that's what. So my father was very proud of me, and I joined the Army, so I could get money to go to school. Because of that, I got a bug. It was called the bug of I um, not satisfied in anything. So I was driven to expand beyond working as a BS engineer for 3M and Dow Chemical, and I went back to graduate school at Virginia Tech, and I became a scientist at Sandia National Labs. When I was at Sandia National Labs, guess how many PhD scientists there were that were Native American? A little bit more than none. Okay. A little bit more. That's it. Two. Two. Out of 8,600 people that were there, um, 3,000 were PhDs, and there were two out of all that population that were Native American that had a PhD. Now, I was a pretty good scientist, too. So I was there, and I learned how to expand my knowledge. And I, I, I won't kid you not, I kid you not, but I was afraid to go there, just like before. And can you guess why? Why, why I was afraid to go there? Sure. That was part of it. What else? Yeah, she said that right. Uh, zone? <clears throat> so I said there was a whole bunch of PhDs there. I'll throw you going and give me an idea. I felt inferior to them. 
And the reason I did was because you had all these people that were exceptional scientists from Caltech, MIT, everywhere. They're smart, not just a little smart, really smart. And I had just finished my degree, and I was like, you know, these guys are smarter. I don't know if I can compete with these people to make a career to move forward in this world. So just like before, I was all the way back down to ground zero again. I was at cashier just wanted something, right? But I had to prove myself, and I did. I realized that by getting out of my comfort zone and willing to overcome my fears, I was able to learn and grow from that experience. So as a result of that, I was extremely successful at Sandia, and I built uh, collaborations with people throughout the world. And in fact, in this little picture right here, I have scientists from Japan that worked in my lab for two years in a venture to try to create a large, larger company for Sharp Corporation. So Sharp Corporation sent two of their scientists from Japan to work with me to help solve something for them because they were impressed with the work that I did. Not just US, they looked everywhere and they liked what I was doing. So I had scientists working with them. Matsumoto, Fujimoto is in here. It was fun. I got to go to Japan, kind of fun. Never been there before. Super cool. It was cool. <clears throat> Since then, I, you know, I had, like I said, I had this bug in me that I just wanted to continue to try to help people. So back then, I used to only help PhD people, so people that had their doctor, and I tried to help them uh, become better at what they did, fix their little problems, etc. But I had all, all the time, I had this bug that. I wanted to help people at the beginnings of their career like you. Right? right now, you don't really know what you could become, what you know, but I wanted to help transition your thought process, your confidence, your knowledge to something far greater than it is right now. So now I'm here. right? I'm in an academic role where now I can help people as they transition and we help through this program, people in high school and elementary school, and even people in college. Right? So it's transition. So here's some other reasons why you might want to go to college. Now, <clears throat> if you look in 2018 alone, 60% of the jobs will require that you have a college degree. So that number 30 years ago, it didn't really matter so much if you had a college degree or now. Now it matters because it's so technical, right? They need you to become more technical, to be more competitive, and they need that, right? So if we just do a little bit of math here, look at the salaries, you know, the high school degree, you might be making around, and these are just averages, maybe $29,000 a year, which is about $11.5 an hour. If you get a non stem degree, you maybe make $40,000, $45,000 an hour, and that's around $21, uh, $22 an hour. If you get a degree in STEM field, you'll be making around $70,000 a year, which is around $33 an hour. If you look at it in terms of a plot of time, a cumulative salary that you make in a lifetime of work, here's high school, here's non STEM, here's STEM. You'll make about a million dollars over your lifetime in high school. If you get a non STEM degree, you'll make a little over $2 million. If you get a STEM degree, you'll make a little over $3 million. Now that's motivation, I think, right? I don't know. Does every does anyone like money? Why? Why do you like money? To be able to live. Why else? To buy what you want, to buy what you need. Right? Travel. Travel. See things. Grow. Experience. But you need money to do it, right? Right? You need money to do this. You need money to help your family. <laughs> money to make things better for them. These are your friends. So this is some reasons why you might want to do this. Right? Why you want to go on for, for further to, to make money. That's part of the reason. Now, I have this little fun thing right here. Uh, this is a couple years ago for my, when my, I only have one son. And we're playing a game of life. Has anyone played life before? Yeah. Once, <laughs> everyone's played life. You've not played life? Okay, we have to correct this problem. Everyone has to play life at least once, and then you can say, I did it. So the objective of life is what? 
you spin a little dial thing, you make decisions about what kind of life you want to have, and then etc. So my son, who's still, you know, just starting high school, we were playing this game at home, and he goes, I don't want to go to college. I just want to, I just want to immediately start a life, right? So next thing you know, you start spinning this dial on life, and what happens? He gets married. What happens then? He has kids. And guess what? I have to buy these things. I have to go to the doctor. Something happened. He goes, I don't have any money. He goes, this sucks. I should have went to college. This is what he literally said. He found that on his own. That through playing the game of life, he figured out that I need to go to college. He figured that out by playing a game. Right? And that's true. Right? Life, this game, if you play it, you will definitely do that. Now, when you're doing this, though, you know, as I said, there's so many majors that I showed you for them. And of course, I emphasize STEM ones because I'm a chemical engineer and that's what I'm going to push. I'm sorry about that, but I'm going to push STEM. But one thing that you can kind of look at to help you in this process is, you know, what were some of your favorite classes? What are you passionate about? If you haven't done something like that, maybe take a career test. Other questions that you might want to ask yourself is, where do you want to live? Right? Where do you want? Where might you want? Sweden. Sweden? Yeah, maybe in Sweden. Um, what kind of jobs do you want to do in the future? Because they can change over time. What do you want to do? And I would say this to you, you know, being a little afraid of making a decision regarding that, you know, I told you a lot of people don't know yet, but it's okay to begin your process undeclared. And if you look at that um, as a statistic, you know, 50% of college students really change their mind one, or, one to three times through their career. So it's okay not to know. Oh, I'm not supposed to go fast. <laughs> Fine, you that saying, okay, my class will have to be late, because I have to go teach a class like this. So if you're selecting your major, <clears throat> you have lots of reasons why you can look at populations of this. Here's, here's a um, business degree showing how it's grown over time quite a bit. Um, you can see also that some of the things that you thought might be large at one time have shrunk. So education has gone smaller, less emphasis in it. Um, if you look at agriculture, it hasn't really grown very much. And if you look at salaries, these are average salaries to give you an idea. Here's engineering, around $65,000 a year. And it's on the uptake, continues to grow because it's an important area and it takes it and impacts a lot of things. Start moving down here, here's healthcare, education. That gives you a spectrum of, of what you'll get paid when you're done. Now, if you start charting your career, you have to start thinking about, do I want to go to public, private, vocational, what kind of degree do I want? A double A, a bachelor's science, bachelor of arts, which I've talked about. Then you want further to get a master's or a PhD. And then even when you pick this place, maybe the academic focus is more theoretical, or maybe it's more practical. That would be the difference between Princeton versus here. Um, you focus on majors and minors, and hopefully you're not going to Cave College where your two skills that you're going to learn are just hunting or gathering, right? So the college itself will give you opportunities. <clears throat> When you're um, charting this path, this career that you have, there's things in here that matter, right? <clears throat> you can look at the campus reputation, where you want to live and where you want to go to school, or even the campus community setting itself. So the reputation, you could look at rankings that matter in the sense of who comes to graduate or who comes to hire you, or maybe what's offered in special life. Or maybe sometimes you want to be closer to home, so you might want to look at it. Or if you're in-state, out-state, there's cost to go down. But the point is that there are a little over 5,000 universities and colleges in the United States that you can choose to go to. So you have a lot of choices to pick from. So I don't want to hear excuses about why I don't want to go, because there's places to go. And as far as setting goes, as I said, you know, you can even go to Princeton, maybe, right? The number one school nationally. When you do pick your place, and you start charting this, right, you may want to start using some metrics that go along with it. Not only location and rank, but you know, how many faculty are there? Who's there? What's their background? How are they going to help you? What are the campus resources that exist? Libraries, computer labs. I remember my first computer lab. I love that. Um, food, social groups, maybe that's really important to you. Or religious or diversity or gender groups, etc. These can all be important infrastructures for you to help you along the way. So this map, <clears throat> my oldest brother belonged to uh, a fraternity, mostly because of Cyan. But anyhow, it's probably not. Will you go grant a fraternity? No. 
I was in the fraternity. But you can do it. I mean, I, I would say do it. It's fun. You're going to make friends out of them. So if you're charting your career, you know, you have to look at some other pieces, which I know are important to you. And these two things are, how much does it cost to go? That's important, right? Or you don't care. Which one is it? Important? It's not on this. It is important, right? So you have to think about what the cost is. And then what financial aid is going to be offered to you. What, what does it take to go with? And then each state themselves will have different costs, which is interesting when you look at this. Uh, the costs are relatively the same, but uh, Nevada is the cheapest one. So if you want to go to Nevada, University of Nevada is the cheaper one to go to. But anyhow, you have to look at this. And the reason you do is because you don't want to do this. You want to minimize the debt you're going to incur, incur when you're getting <laughs> right? Because that can be big. So I'd say while you're doing this and you kind of looked at location, cost, etc., then I would start saying, within well, your institute, create some type of selection criteria. I would say pros and cons, right? Think about the time frame that you intend to go. Most schools start at the beginning of fall, so where you want to plan for that. So that means you have to plan ahead. You to help with your decision, I would say there's a whole bunch of things you can do. You can look at common catalogs, maybe even do a visit, look at websites, talk to um, friends, alumni, high school counselors, campus advisors, etc. And create a whole list of people, places that you may want to go. And realize that in this process that you're not done, right? You're just going to keep adding to it, right? You're going to revise these ideas of what you want to do. <clears throat> and then, once you've narrowed this down, now it's time to apply, right? Put together an application. So you're going to have to have pieces in here that go into this thing. You need to try to have a high as GPA as possible, and if you've done your associates, that would be a part of it. You'll look at test scores. You'll have to write a college essay. Why do I want to go here? Right? That'll have to be some type of motivational thing. Um, nowadays, there are so many people <coughs> applying to college that it's sometimes difficult to read one from another or select one from another, that sometimes you need to have some extracurricular activity, math, science, drama clubs, community outreach, um, things that you've done try to help others, right? That means something uh, when the, the group is making the decision to accept it. So, um, recommendation letters, um, and then also your demonstrated interest. This is something you have control of. So I remember when I went to Montana State, I was afraid, so I, I reached out to the department head and asked him questions, and of course he replied back to me, because that's a part of what their job is. And through those dynamics, I was able to be convinced to go there, which is the same story for my PhD. So that matters, so showing that interest. So when you're selecting a school, though, and you have these wish lists, right, they're, they are selective in some cases, but as I said, there's a lot of schools to choose from. And because of that, you have lots of selections, and I know you'll get in. But I would also say, you know, create some backup schools, because maybe your number one choice is Princeton, but for whatever reasons, you know, due to, due to life, right, maybe you don't get in. So that means have some other alternatives. And um, University of Idaho is a great place. University of Nebraska is a great place. Right? Opportunities to go. But my point is, always have some backup ideas. But as I pointed out at the very beginning in talking about this in the previous talk, you know, a college and an education unlocks opportunities for you that high school will never unlock for you. It will unlock potentials within you that will be a journey that would be a lot of fun. Life is fun. So let's think about that game plan in life. Right? Don't stop there. Keep going. Right? So <clears throat> once you've done all that stuff and put all those packages together, the next thing that's going to happen is you're going to get some, you're going to be accepted somewhere. Right? You'll be offered, you'll get some letter like this letter I have right here. This comes from Clemson and saying, Welcome. You've been accepted. Here's your package offer that you have. Whatever it is that they say there. But you get a letter saying, Welcome. Welcome to becoming a future alumni to our university our college. And at that point, you know, make sure you've dotted all your I's and cross all your T's, make sure that paperwork is done. Sign the letter. I want to go. You know, don't write, I want to go. Actually, like your name, okay? Load up. I don't even think they have books like bugs that are convertible anymore. But anyhow, you get in and you go, right? Start that adventure. It'll be fun. So 
We've talked quite a bit about challenges that you're going to have ahead of you. Some of these challenges are, as I said, getting out of that comfort zone that you're in, progressing beyond that fear. Be willing to grow where you haven't been before, right? To be able to achieve new opportunities. Because success is ahead of us. I'd like to be able to see you, be able to take a picture of you um, graduating with your BA or your BS or maybe your PhD. There's very strong groups at the University of Arizona if you want to culture that has lots of Native Americans, they're number one. Highest enrollment in Native Americans. So let me end here. I'm excited for you to start a journey. I hope at some point in time you'll send me an email or send me a letter talking about the things that you've achieved. And if you're really bored and you don't know what to do, as this cartoon says, I'm so bored, there's nothing to do. College gives you an opportunity to do something, and not only do something, but do something that could be dramatic in what you could do later on. And guess what? It's a lot of fun. It's fun to be able to help others. And as I said, my career has moved along the way it's done because I was tired of trying to help PhD people, you know, doctors, people come to me and I'm just thinking, man, our education system is not doing a good job with Americans because I had to hire Americans and I really wanted to hire people from China because they were smarter. And I wanted to change that. And it wasn't that Americans are not smart, it's just that our education system has failed us and it's no longer allowing them to have the potential that they could have, as I talked about in the beginning. Who you could become is yet to be known. Right. Well, I was a Star Trek guy, which I am. I'd say, we're going into undiscovered territory. Let's go on this journey together. <laughs> Both down and stop. And I'd have to answer a couple of questions really quick, but I gotta go run and teach another class.